there are worms. Uh, and we have a great panel that General Siemens is going to introduce to you in just a second. But let me just give you a quick uh, background, which you already know, and that's why you're here about AUSA. As you know, it is your professional association. The Association of the United States Army Institute of Land Warfare is proud to present forums like this one throughout the year uh, to broaden the knowledge base of Army professionals and those who support our Army. Uh, for those who knew me when I was the Under Secretary of the Army uh, or the Acting Secretary, um, and this is an important topic considering the topic is about personal readiness and modernization. 90% of those great young Americans we bring in every year get their news from social media. So please use the hashtag at AUSA2018. Uh, and don't be afraid to tweet, and as long as it's positive here. Um, <laughs> And a great intro and all that stuff. I appreciate it. I'm at, at Patrick Murphy, PA. Uh, but this is the last of AUSA's ILW Contemporary Military Forum, uh, continuing to be the voice of the Army and support for our soldiers. And before we begin, let's recognize AUSA's strong membership base, which is vitally important for our advocacy efforts in Congress, the Pentagon, the Defense Industrial Base, and to the public and communities across the country through AUSA's 123 local chapters. Uh, and if you are an AUSA member, please stand if you're able to do so right now. Thank you so very much. We appreciate it. Uh, let's give those members a round of applause for making today possible. Uh, for those of you uh, Army professionals who are not yet members of your professional association, we encourage you to join AUSA by visiting the AUSA membership booth, booth 307, Exhibit A, uh, Exhibit Hall A, or sign up online at ausa.org slash membership. And you all know the cadence. Gave you $100 and take back 99 So that's part of the gig. Um, all right. So thanks for those members for staying with us. And I'd like to now turn the floor over uh, real quick uh, before I do that. The Army, under our statutory responsibility to what we do as a Department of the Army, is to man, train, and equip the Army. That is an awesome responsibility. If you didn't see the news this morning, Mission Readiness uh, came out with a report that 71% of young Americans cannot join our military, mostly because of obesity. Uh, and you look at, so we're dealing with a 29% of population that can even come into our military. But as an organization, we hire more millennials than any other organization throughout the world. About 120,000 millennials join our ranks every single year. That's an awesome responsibility that this panel has to deal with every single day on behalf of our nation. So with that, let me turn the floor over to Lieutenant General Howard Bromberg, uh, USA Army retired, former Deputy Chief of Staff, G1. Here we go. Well, let me get, let me, hold on a second. I apologize. We're getting with the varsity team. This is, I thought it was, DG1, not deputy, DG1, Tom Siemens, who is tasked with that 120,000 millennials every year. Tom, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm glad my wife's not here. She would have liked the retired part of that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, and welcome to the last panel on the last day. Ready today, more lethal tomorrow, and I would add to that, more lethal tomorrow through talent management. My name is Tom Siemens, and I have the honor of serving as your G1. It's my pleasure today to spend time with you as we talk about America's Army's greatest asset, our people. Who? Who? The readiness of our units and the ability to fight and win our nation's war is related directly to the personnel readiness and how we manage our soldiers and families. Getting the individual talents to allow the placement of the right person in the right place at the right time over time. We have the opportunity right now to do some truly revolutionary things in regard to human capital enterprise. We've been giving new authorities by Congress to consider changes to the way we recruit, promote, manage the careers of our soldiers. We're exploring new ways to harness the individual talents of each soldier to ma maximize their potential and their contributions to the Army. We have across our formations leadership today who believe in talent management. So we have a lot to talk about today, and I'm pleased to introduce the very esteemed panel for our discussion. Starting from second to the right, Mr. Marshall Williams, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. Mr. Williams retired uh, from the Army as a senior enlisted advisor to the 19th and 20th Secretaries of Defense, 
where he's instrumental in resolving strategic personnel issues impacting 1.2 million service members across the formations. He was confirmed in March of 18 as a principal deputy for the Assistant Secretary of the Army, Manpower and Reserve Affairs. Who? Lieutenant, Ger Lieutenant General Darrell Williams, no relation. Uh, superintendent, of <laughs> superintendent of the United States Military Academy. General Williams took over as the 60th superintendent in June of 2018 and was uh, commanded from the battalion to the three-star level. Throughout his career, he's been using experience to shape the next generation of leaders at West Point. Major General John Evans, Commanding General of the United States Army Cadet Command at Fort Knox. John Evans became the CG of Cadet Command in May of 2018. An aviator by trade, he's been managing the talented aviators as part of USASOC and is now using his, his experience to build the next generation of leaders in ROTC. Sitting next to him is Major General Jason Evans, no relation. That's a joke. Yeah, the jokes don't get any better. Uh, <laughs> Jason's the uh, commanding general of the United States Army Hum Human Resources Command. Jason's been developing and executing the Army's personnel policies his entire career and intensely for the last year as part of the MNRA, the TAG, the DMPM, and now HRC. His insights and experience are key as we develop the policies that will shape our future leaders. Rear General Promotable J.P. McGee, who's the director of the Talent Management Task Force. J.P. took over the Talent Management Task Force in July of 2018. He's also served as the DCG of Operations for our cyber, where he was responsible for developing the Army's cyber talent. He's now spearheading the Army's efforts to revolutionize how we manage talent. Who? Sitting to his left is uh, Brigadier General Michelle Lecter, Commanding General of the Joint Munitions Command. Uh, General Lecter uh, became the CG of Joint Munitions Command in June of 2018. She served numerous uh, key logistics uh, positions from battalion, brigade, and general officer commands, as well as the logistics assignment officer at HRC, managing the future leaders of the log logistics community. Who? Uh, next is General, or Colonel, uh, maybe soon to be General, well, someday to be General. <laughs> Colonel Greg Johnson, Division Chief of the Functional Management Directorate, Integrated Pay and Personnel System Army. Colonel jo Johnson has been spearheading the Army's IPSA transition for over two years. His efforts will transform how we manage personnel well into the future. And our moderator today is one of my heroes, Lieutenant General Retired Howard Bromberg, who retired uh, a distinguished career. The last two assignments were as the DCG of Forcecom and the 46th G1 of our Army. Ready today, more lethal tomorrow through talent management. I look forward to the discussion. Who will serve? So I, th I think what we're going to do here is we'll start off with some opening comments across the panel. We'll just go start right to left, and they'll all go 10 minutes or less or so. As you also have uh, cards out, please uh, don't wait till the very end to send up your questions. Go ahead, you can be sending them up during any speaker as the questions are fresher in your mind. And uh, I'll be the moderator for the, uh, for the session and help uh, uh, funnel the questions, but also keep us on time. So there's plenty of time for dialogue from the audience. So it's important. Anybody else who's coming in uh, as you're walking in, please fill in the seats in the front too. There's plenty of extra spaces for the bright uh, questions that will come forward from the audience. Okay, so we'll start with, uh, with uh, the uh, Secretary, if you would, sir. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Absolutely. I got to tell you something. I'm, I'm extremely excited. I'm amazed we have this number of people here this late <laughs> on the last day. All right? Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, uh, it's exciting for me, for sure. We're here to talk about talent management. And it's because we're all tasked with ensuring that we have the strongest and most capable army, but not just for today. Talent management has everything to do with what we're going to look like tomorrow and beyond. I am hoping that the questions you ask are not just looking at where we are, but where we're going to be. The Secretary of the Army has said that to make lasting change in our military, you must change our personnel system. I'm in agreement. We have been fortunate 
in years past. But the things that brought me into our army a thousand years ago won't get us to where we need to be for today's soldiers. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a battle. And so I want to introduce you to my battle buddies. The folks are in the fight. What battle are we in? We're in a battle for talent. Every corporation, Gerald McGee can tell you this right here because we just came from the event together. Every corporation is after the same folks that we're after, that very small pool of individuals. And so to entice them to come into our army, one of the things that the secretary said during the opening statement is that each of you are recruiters. So first, by December, I expect to see one individual brought into our army by all of you. <laughs> but it's not just good enough to bring them in. <clears throat> we got to change the way we look at them for promotion, for retention. And through that entire process, we got to have space for individuals who go and get a PhD. Can we really begin to think about promoting individuals off of merit as opposed to seniority? These and many, many more things are the things that we are looking at in developing this new talent management plan, if you will. Now, how does the MNRA fit in all of this? I know that all of you know what Title X does. And so I won't bore you with that. But Title X gives the MNRA authority and the supervision of the entire personnel enterprise, or the five pillars of the Army, the active component, the National Guard, the Reserves, our Army civilians, and contractors. They are all important in making and keeping this Army strong. So how do we execute this authority? Well, we do it the old-fashioned way. We allocate resources. That's how we do it. And we also, along with the G1, establish policies that govern that personal, that personnel enterprise. We are in the process now of developing a human capital plan for 2028 and beyond. It will involve both military and civilian. And it will be a simple framework because there's some things that we must do. We must recruit the best. Quality over quantity is here to stay. We must train and educate our force to be lethal and by doing so, reduce non-deployable rates improve data analytics, increase predictability for soldiers and families. If we want to maintain and retain the best that America has to offer. I got a few other things I'm just going to say and I'm going to turn the rest of my time over. But I want to emphasize this. If we want to remain a world-class army, we must have world-class talent. The big thing is, and something that uh, if you don't remember anything else, understand that this is not 
our talent. This is not Gerald McGee's problem or anyone else on this panel. What we're talking about right now, today, is an Army problem. It's that big. If we're going to maintain the success we've had, we have to get this right. There's no doubt about that. There is absolutely no failure here. We have a very unique Army. And we will continue to be the envy of the world if we can continue to attract develop and retain the best men and women in America. I know we can, and I know we will. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Let's thanks. Let's move right down the okay, line. Okay, sir, thanks. Yeah. Sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Darrell Ames. I'm the superintendent of uh, the United States Military Academy. Back in the back, I got a good infantryman, battle buddy, Command Sergeant Major. Stand up for a second. Jack Love is my Command Sergeant Major, oh. paratrooper. Uh, we at West Point uh, consider that uh, the United States Military Academy is the world's preeminent leader development institution. And uh, we try to really hard at working at that. We call it the 47 month experience. We just brought in 1,210 cadets uh, this summer, and we were about 4,400 cadets. And uh, what the secretary was just talking about uh, with respect to talent management, we're going after and hunting uh, about 12,000, 12,000 to 1,250 uh, every year uh, try to come into West Point, and about 1,000 come in. So I see Mr. Lewis is out in the audience, and I got General Ham and uh, General Bromberg, and they know that uh, I'm not too smart. So I'm going to show a video <laughs> to uh, start it off here. I've been in this slot before, so go ahead and roll the video here, and I'll talk a little bit more very quickly. And your task is clear. It is to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to defend the American people. And you will do that through readiness, readiness for combat. You didn't come here to play ping pong. You came here to learn how to fight, and fight you will. Like those that came before you, you're going to prevail, and you will win. And you will win. So educate, train, and inspire. We've got to attract the right kind of athletes, student athletes to come into West Point, and then win. We're all about winning at the United States Military Academy. Everything we do, whether it be on the athletic field whether it be coming out of a helicopter or whether it be in the classroom. That's the culture we try to manifest every single day at West Point. The slide here, very quickly, talks about, uh, in a very simple way, our individual leader development and our leader development model. The first two years at West Point, the cadets practice following. 
and then the last two years they move to leading. So they learn how to lead by watching others lead them, and then they move into those roles as they go up into their junior and senior college first of year. And then it's all in a culture of character growth. And you can see down at the bottom the outcomes, living honorably, leading honorably, and demonstrating excellence in everything we do. So as Mr. Williams talked about, uh, we are hunting for those same sorts of cadets who, uh, and John will talk about from an ROTC perspective in a minute, but we're all competing for those same athletes to get ready for the crucible of ground combat. Our chief is pretty clear about that. We're about readiness, we're about modernization and reform. So as the cadets are going through and taking their studies, their eye on the ball is about being a second lieutenant to lead our sons and daughter in combat. And we're focused on that every single day. Personally, my son just graduated. He's headed out to Lewis. He'll be a ranger. My other son, a law is in the 375. My other son just got out of 101st. So it's a family business for the Williams family. And uh, so I, I lean into this every single day, and I look forward to your, your questions. Thank you. Hey, thanks, sir. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to have a conversation about this uh, with regards to talent management, particularly uh, with regards to how it ties to personnel readiness and modernization. So if I get the first slide. These are the three tasks that we kind of focus on in the ROTC enterprise. And to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, how we compare uh, to, to West Point in some, uh, at some levels, we're kind of the scale folks. We are scale and scope. So uh, as the soup just said, they got about 4,400 cadets at West Point. We've got about 33,000 in ROTC. They started 1,200 this year. We started about 9,400. And we'll commission about 6,000 of those young men and women into the Army as lieutenants across all three components. So we have a multi-compo mission to do that. And about 3,000 of them will be commissioned into the active force. So uh, we have a, a nuanced, different role than the Academy does with regards to going out and finding talent because of the way it brings diversity into the force. So we are out there producing second lieutenants of uh, quality, of character, of competence, we are developing professional cadre that we send back out to the field. So we don't have a, um, a professional military professor type program in West at uh, ROTC. We bring folks in to be assistant professors of military science or professors of military science or senior military instructors on the enlisted side. And then we push them back out to the force so that they can share some of the knowledge and attributes they've gained. And having touched recently the youngest group of leaders in our army that can take that back out to the field with them. And then finally, we, we have responsibility, which I didn't realize until I took the job, for <laughs> junior ROTC as well. So uh, the scope and scale, that's pretty significant if you're not familiar with it. 1,700 programs, 1,700 uh, high schools across the world, because anywhere we've got a U.S. military installation with a high school associated with it, we've got a junior ROTC program. Uh, and about 315,000 high schoolers out there that are in the junior ROTC programs. And I'll be more than happy to talk about that component of what we do if anybody has questions there. Uh, if I can get the next slide real quick, and then what I'm going to do is, is move the ball along here. I wanted to throw this up. The suit kind of talked about how their leader model works at West Point. It's not unlike the, the leader model that we use in ROTC. Uh, we spend the first two years uh, in the followership role, if you will, with our, uh, with our cadets. And then the junior and senior years, you'll see that they move into leadership roles as they're preparing to move out into the force as lieutenants. The uh, advantage we have in ROTC is that unlike um, the academy where there's a four-year model, you've got to kind of got to start as a freshman to get to the end, we have the ability to take lateral entry cadets in ROTC. So a young man or woman who is finishing their sophomore year in college decides, hey, you know, I, I like what they're doing over at Army ROTC. I think I would like to be an Army leader. Have I missed the train? No, you haven't. We're going to send you to basic camp at Fort Knox for 31 days, kind of get you caught up uh, to the degree that we can on, on some of the basic blocking and tackling of soldiering. And then you're going to spend the next two years, your junior and senior year, in the program. You'll go to advanced camp after your junior year, and then you'll graduate and be commissioned as a second lieutenant in your senior year. So that's kind of the, the significant difference we have is that we can turn a little bit inside of the academy with regards to production of second lieutenants because of our ability to do this lateral accession mission. And so I think I'll leave it there uh, and pass it along. 
If you are tweeting or twittering or whatever and you want to uh, hit me up, I'm CG underscore Army ROTC. Feel free to hit me up uh, for any questions that we don't get to handle today. I'm going to pass it to my brother, Jason Evans. Hey, Jason, you guys, make sure you guys speak in the mic because it's a little bit stuck coming through clear in the back. Roger, sir. Thanks, John. Good afternoon. Um, excited to be here. Uh, as the Human Resources Command, we are the distributor of the preponderance of the Army's talent worldwide to meet unit readiness and increase lethality. Um, slide, please. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about, uh, you've heard the Secretary's comments yesterday about our portion or his intent on reform in terms of the personnel system and cookie cutter timelines. Well, we're not waiting for that. Um, one, one example of that is the assignment interactive module, which we've modeled uh, or piloted over the last year. And so we found out that, you know, this has allowed us to be more transparent with officers. It's allowed us to put all the requirements on the table so they can see them and interact with their career managers. It's allowed unit commanders to participate in that model as well. And so that, that creates a greater interaction of the officer in terms of preferences and choices as we balance uh, the needs of the Army. The biggest thing uh, that will really allow us to evolve, and in some cases revolutionize, the Army personnel system is, is the Defense Officer Management Personnel Act and ROTMA. And this act um, has not been uh, reformed in over 38 years. And so those of you who remember OPMS 21, which is really the, the framework we're operating under now, they did not have the advantage then of any reform of DOTMA or ROTMA. The reform that we have with DOTMA and ROTMA will allow us uh, much more flexibility in terms of how we manage talent and how we can extend career timelines and really how, you know, career, um, as, as you heard the Secretary talk about yesterday, the cookie cutter of uh, timelines uh, for specific officers. It'll allow us to have more flexibility in terms of uh, promotion with officers. Uh, the next thing that, that gets little attention, um, the officers uh, really will be the first priority uh, with the Talent Management Task Force, is the enlisted piece. And so we've been working hard with the enlisted piece because most of the career managers at HRC have at least 2,500 individuals they're managing. And that's, that's, that's pretty hefty. And you, you don't, if you're down there for two or three years, you may or may not get to talk to all of them. So we focused really on the staff sergeants and above to give them more attention, to try to get, you know, cultivate their preferences as we do uh, requirements. And you can see up here that we're going to go to manning cycles, five, nine-week manning cycles, so we can be proactive in how we uh, do requirements. Right now, the requirements come in and you're working pretty much every day, and then you're trying to find someone to get on that requirement. Really, it's about how do you interact with the right person in enough time for them and their family to be prepared for that and for that individual and have enough time to make sure you're putting the right individual on that requirement. And you can see the NCO contact program, which is not new, and, and ask uh, the assignment survey there. That's not new. And so in concert with that and the cycles, we can be more predictive, similar to the manning cycles we have for the officers for the NCOs. But the biggest thing is if you look at the manner performance um, tool that we have now, we have never had that in the past. We now can assess staff sergeant and above in terms of where you're at with your peers. We can now look at an installation and make sure that we're distributing the talent uh, evenly to the commands, and you can have a conversation with the individual NCO unlike you've been able to have before, before and after assignment. Um, with that, I look forward to your questions. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Letcher. I'm the Commanding General for Joint Munitions Command. I'm also honored to be part of this panel today. One, because I'm a professional, but two, because it's very personal to me when it comes to talent management. Um, I don't have a slide, so I'll start with a slight vignette. A couple of years ago, I was at a uh, fellowship for Senior Service College, and we had a senior leader come talk to the group. And we could ask questions like you could in this forum. And I asked the question, why can't I grow up to be Chief of Staff of the Army? not because of my gender, but because of my branch. And that, ended, that senior leader looked at me and he said, it's because you don't understand lethality. And so I wasn't deterred, right? And I walked away and I thought, well, I'll have to figure out a way to be the chief's boss someday. But, um, but when we talk about being ready today and more lethal tomorrow, we should be growing talent that each one of us could grow up to be the chief of staff of the Army or the sergeant major of the Army. And so I think it's really important 
um, as mentors and leaders that not only do we find that talent and harness that talent, but we don't constrain it by putting limitations on it. I command Joint Munitions Command, which um, is very different than most of the commands that the people at the table have. I have about 15,000 people inside the organization, and only 27 of them wear a uniform. So talent management's a little bit different. Um, now, each and every one of these employees are as important to the mission and the execution and delivering readiness as any green-suited organization. And I say that because when we discuss talent management, management, our aperture has to be much wider than 51 MOSs. It must include the 31 career programs and a contracted force that supports our ability to deliver readiness, or in my case, delivering lethality that wins. Now, talent management, it's about optimizing the potential of the individual in concert with organizational requirements. So how do we as an Army build the next Eisenhower, right? If we pulled his officer record brief, no individual in this room would sign up to do those assignments. No mentor would suggest anyone do it, and HRC probably wouldn't assign it. And yet it worked for him. So how do we as leaders drive this sort of optimization so it develops an individual for not just the needs of the organization they're in today or for their next assignment, but for the Army in a broader sense? Now, my organization, my um, engaged workforce needs to be aligned to my mission needs. And so my human capital plan focuses on improving a culture of communication, improving feedback and accountability, and emphasizing meaningful training and developmental opportunities and initiatives. We have employees in 27 of those 31 career fields, making it a challenge to manage and develop across the enterprise. We have to navigate the various skill sets and identify gaps and mitigations and strategies, and in turn, feedback through evaluations. Not all career programs are made equal. Um, they have different budgets inconsistencies, um, different personnel resources, the maturity of the program. Some of the programs came out in 2001. Um, and then just different competencies and stratifications. So internally we had to build, um, build a human capital plan that really addressed the needs of the civilian workforce that I have inside my organization. So we did three things. We focused on leader and supervisor development because the way we do in the green suited side, we have very deliberate leadership schools and um, opportunities in place. So we had to do that internal. So we emphasized completion of a 40-hour supervisory development course, um, some supervisory training, partnering people with other supervisors who had the experience. We used supervisor surveys and focus group sessions. So we have the MSAP 360 on the green suitor side. We used a leader assessment tool on the civilian side so that they received that same free feedback and then internal supervisory skills sessions. Secondly, we had improved feedback and accountability. So it wasn't just about the supervisor, it was the person being supervised having the ability to provide feedback. Um, DP map was the linchpin to all of it. Um, we aligned performance evaluations from the top down so that the civilian workforce understood what the requirements were. And then for anyone who does um, civilian evaluations, you know, in the past we saw a lot of all fives. And so it was realigning inside the organization the difference between a five and a three. And then it was okay to get a three inside the organization and how you could, you know, attain a five. And I mean, we saw that on the green suitor side when we changed the OER system, but it's same on the civilian leadership side. And then finally, we, decided, we developed a career development model inside the organization that everyone understood. And so feedback was that about 78% of the organization felt that they had very good communication before the, between the supervisor and the supervised. And what we do is over time, we monitor that to try to increase those metrics so that communication becomes the tool. Subject to your questions. Good afternoon. I'm Brigadier General J.P. McGee, the Director of the Talent Management Task Force. It's always great to sit on these panels. I feel like this is a secret plan by General Ham to bring me back every quarter or so, no matter what job I am, to like go through like a senior thesis, like defense of my thesis from old senior leaders. We've got General Ham, Secretary Murphy, General Bromberg, all these old bosses get to uh, expose me and ask all sorts of hard questions. So I always love coming up here and having these conversations with all of you. The, the Army's mission is to win wars by dominating long, land combat. And uniquely to the Army, our most important asset is the people. We're not a platform-based service. We are based, you know, our, our core most important asset we have 
are the people that we bring into this, which is why talent management is so critically important to us as we look forward to future combat and, and dominating land combat. So talent management is an interesting field to be in because talent management runs the danger of being all things to all people. Because if you look at the academic definition of talent management, it says it's everything that's associated with acquiring, develop, employing, and retaining. And so part of our mission within the talent management task force is actually determining which, you know, we will we'll pay, play a role in all of those, which, which one specifically. Because there is a potential of too much mission creep if we go down too, too far down any one of those, uh, of those avenues. But I think at its core, what talent management describes is a philosophy and a way of looking at, at how, we, how we deal with our, with our leaders first, because our task has been to look at the officer corps first, is how do we put the right officer in the right place so that, that officer can maximally contribute to the success of the Army's mission? And that starts to imagine a different process uh, and an improvement upon the process that we've been doing so far, one that takes strong considerations of the officer's knowledge, skills, behaviors, and preferences to make sure that that officer is put in that position and can contribute to the Army's mission. What I think is really tremendously interesting and exciting about this time is there's this confluence of work that's been done past by task talent management directors as we've moved this ball forward and we've begun the experimentation phase with things that are now in full phase operation across the Army. So we've got talent-based branching. So all officers that are now coming into the uh, the Army by the end of this year will have been part of a process that looks at them as cadets or as candidates and, and does an assessment of how they are as individuals and then helps them match with a branch that they would be best suited, suited to so they can, can contribute and right from the beginning as a second lieutenant maximally to the uh, to the Army. So we're starting, we've started that at West Point. It bled over to ROTC and now we're doing it within uh, officer candidate school in this, in this next year. And so we're already bringing in a whole cohort of officers that are used to being looked at individually and then managed in a way that's appropriate and, and maximizes their skill set. So we're already doing this thing called AIM 2.0, the Army Interactive Module 2.0 which does some form of a marketplace so uh, an officer can put what his knowledge, skills, behaviors, preferences are, and then there's a match from a unit to make sure that that person who's applying for that job is a good match and that unit wants them. And so this is the next phase forward as we look at establishing some form of a marketplace for how we do officer assignments. But I think what's really compelling right now is the strong alignment of the big four within the Army, the secretary and the chief, the vice and the under, who are very passionate about us moving this forward and making and, and making some significant changes and improvements. And then the other piece is just in August, we were granted a new NDAA that gave us nine new authorities to execute. And so as we approach this as a talent management task force, we see our initial main effort as, as, as fully expanding into these authorities that have been granted to us by Congress, and then using that to inform the rest of the changes that will be following behind as we, as we start looking at this. So our methodology is first off to study the current state of nature of how we are doing officer management and how we will look at potentially transition that to talent management and how we can then inform leaders, make sure we're piloting these in a small scale and then developing them across the Army over the next period of, of two years. So it's a pretty exciting time to be here and a tremendous opportunity for our Army to take, uh, take advantage of all this alignment that we have right now. But at the end state, it is still to create a more lethal Army that is maximizing the contribution of every officer and eventually every non-commissioned officer and every civilian that we have within our ranks. And so I'd like to then introduce uh, Colonel Greg Johnson, who's our, our partner in all of this, who's working on an incredibly important mission with IPSA. And Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I have just a few slides. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to come here and talk today. Um, I, I'm looking down the panel here and, and thinking I, I need to keep up with all these initiatives that are going on uh, throughout the Army and, and get them into IPSA. Um, so a, a lofty task, and, and, and we're working hard to, to make that a reality and, and get it done. Um, just up, up, up and uh, you know, foremost in my mind is, hey, integrated personnel and pay system Army uh, is meant to do a lot of things. And, and one of the key elements is to be the engine between uh, moving our system of personnel management to more of a talent management system. Um, so that's the engine. Um, so that's why I have to be linked with not just the talent, task force talent management, but with HRC, with OEMA at, at, uh, at West Point, with Cadet Command, 
um, because there's lots of initiatives going on, there's lots of, of good things going on um, that we need to make sure is in the system so that we can utilize it and execute talent management uh, better than what we're doing today. Um, lots of good things going on today, but, but I think there's room that we can grow and move and, and improve. Uh, one of the key things and key problems that we have is in the Army, um, there's 200 personnel and pay systems. So that's, that's not a made up number. Um, each component has its own system, um, and then there's a complete air gap between personnel and pay. Um, so the issue is data. Where is the data? Um, and what system is it in? Uh, what's authoritative? Um, that, that's a problem that we have to solve. And, and IPSA is meant to consolidate most of that data into one view, so it's total force. Put all 1.1 million soldiers into the system, and then let's start to think about um, the holistic talents of each of our individual soldiers. How do we expand that? Um, that's, that's one of the key components that IPSA will bring to the table. Um, and if you uh, want to go two slides forward, um, we have a bit uh, of, a, of a working model, um, if you go on slide forward, um, of the 25 point profile. Um, so through lots of working groups, through lots of sessions with commanders, all three components, all echelons, we asked what, what kind of talent information do you want to, do you want to track? Um, and, and what we came up with was essentially a 25 point profile, there it is. Um, so things in yellow are, are, are self-professed. Things in gray are emerging concepts like assessments, uh, MOP score, et cetera. Um, some is just very basic data commanders want, readiness, um, information about your experiences uh, that you've gained through the military, your training, uh, et cetera. Um, our problem set is how do you consolidate that data? How do you consolidate that, that, that data and then ask uh, and understand individuals' true talents? Um, and then in the system, how do I display that? So for career managers uh, to use, for commanders to use, um, to essentially push us uh, into more of a talent management system. Um, so we're tremendously excited uh, about the work that's been done, the initiatives throughout the Army, and uh, we'll continue to push and get those into the system. And I look forward to your questions. So those are great, uh, great lead-ins for what will be a uh, great discussion here as we go into the panel. And please keep your questions coming up. And also there's microphones. If, uh, if somebody prefers to engage the panel directly, please feel free to step up to the microphone and, uh, and have a dialogue at the same time. We have plenty of time for that. So I just want to start off uh, with just the first uh, general question for the group. And I think it's one that we started with, with those great comments. And because I know there's a lot of, a lot of questions about it. But when you look at, uh, and this, this one came from the audience, and I'm going to modify your question slightly because some of the questions are, are, are run together, so I want to be able to kind of get the best, best, uh, best thing to have the dialogue. So if you look at the, the uh, changes from DOTMA, ROTMA, how do you think that is going to really drive the change in, in uh, talent management? Is it too early to tell, or what do you see on the future? So I'll start off with uh, Secretary Williams on that one, I think, and then we'll ask to go on down into maybe uh, General Evans and General McGee. You know, over the years, uh, there's been a number of changes to DOTMA ROTMA, um, some of which we didn't take advantage of. I think it's too early to tell right now, but I think we're in a good space. And I will uh, relinquish my time to the folks who actually <laughs> deal with this right here on a daily basis. Sir, if you want to. Yeah, go ahead, jump on in. I, Thank you. I think General Evans is pushing over to me, which is which is great. So, you know, the Talent Management Task Force has been given the uh, mission of, of of adopting these authorities and then and then using them maximally. And so, here's how I think this this all plays together. So, first off, it's probably worthwhile to refresh in everyone's mind what the Army was given and all the services were given. So, we've now been given the authority as a service to be able to direct commission into the rank of Colonel for designated specialties by the uh, by the service secretary. So, everyone's sort of used to talking about cyber, but it could be anything that the secretary says. So, if you want a supply chain logistics expert from Amazon, we would have the ability to uh, to bring that person in as you know up to as high as a colonel if, they, if it was a good skill set match and bring them in or a force. Um, there is now the ability to extend the mandatory retirement not to 30 years but to 40 years at the, at the secretary's direction. So if you think about managing an officer's career now, not based on a 20 or 30 year model but a 40 year model, all of a sudden you've got some expanded you know, abilities to do some very interesting broadening developmental assignments. 
got the ability for the secretary to much more rapidly, selectively continue those officers who have special skills, who may not have been uh, selected for a promotion board because of maybe an off-the-path career pattern, but they've been able, the secretary will identify them and keep them in, in a very uh, robust fashion. One of the things that is going to be really interesting as we look at an officer will start to have the ability to opt out of promotion boards. And so the chief and the secretary have both been very clear that they'd like to stop the conveyor belt process where an officer ha feels like they have to shift jobs every two or three years, has to promote for promotion boards in a certain timeline where you've got a little bit of flexibility. So, you know, if you're a, if you're a captain who wants to be an MBA at a top tier school and then wants to go serve in the Ranger Regiment, you're not constrained by having to compete for the major promotion board if you opt out of that and you're actually doing an activity that's of long-term value to the, uh, to the Army. There's some work we're doing about uh, commissioning more rapidly members of the National Guard in terms of federal uh, recognition. Some age limit extensions for some people that we bring in uh, at a slightly older age, so directly relinked to the direct commissioning. Um, and then there's also the ability for selectively the, the secretary to promote people who with just two years in a, uh, in a rank if someone's a particularly high performer. And then the final one, and this is one that we're going to adopt, the Navy has already been doing within their SEAL community and within their nuclear force, is if you've got a 04, you know, a major who's filling a lieutenant colonel's job, the secretary has the ability to spot promote that person into that and start take that major, make them a lieutenant colonel as long as they're still in that lieutenant colonel position, performing satisfactorily at lieutenant colonel level, they're promoted and paid as that. So those are a number of the changes that we think are going to start driving some changes. And clearly you can understand how that would change a number of things. What I think I'm pretty happy with our approach right now is that these will be the initial efforts that we focus on. And as we're doing this, we're going to learn all the different parts of the Army that come together to do these changes because the Army's personnel system is spread out across multiple different organizations. We're going to establish that network to how to affect this change. And then the larger set of changes will be right behind them as we're looking and exploring about how to do this. But I think the NGA enactment and, and actually you know, growing into those authorities are going to be really helpful for us to determining the rest of the way forward for the Army. Super. Thank you. That's great. Great, great, great answer. Appreciate it. So with that lead in, I'd like to pass the next one out to Greg Johnson there because I think this is a, this is a, a comment that comes up in many people, people's mind is, so, so what, we saw the chart. So what, what makes the IPSA program different from the past efforts that the Army showed? What are the significant things? Not just the 25 chiclet chart there, but what really in your mind brings those things forward to execute some of the things General McGee talked about? Yeah, I, I, absolutely, sir. Sure. Um, I mean, first, first and foremost, you know, this program is, is built in, in, and is being staffed and being worked by, by the Army. Um, so this, this is about us. Um, we've, uh, we've changed how we're, we're developing this system than, than previous systems uh, based on how uh, we've included um, all assets and all facets of all three components and all stakeholders in, in the build of the system. Um, so we started with the baseline requirements, but we've run – uh, what we call agile work teams um, to, to build the functionality out in, in the system. Um, right now we're, we're in our final test for our release two up with the National Guard um, and they uh, primarily plugged into us over the last 18 months to help shape and build a system that they're going to roll out. So, so from that, that uh, angle, sir, it's very different from, from past developments. Um, what that also allows us to do as we move forward is we'll, we'll be able to change the software and the system to meet the needs of the Army. This is a massive difference. You can't do that today, and that's primarily why you have 200 personnel pay systems in the Army. It's not easy to change a 1986 cobalt-based thing called SIDPERS, which there's 54 versions in the National Guard. Each state and territory has one. They're all different. Um, the data is bad. So the ability to ship, uh, shape and change the system, uh, change it to the Army's needs, um, that, that's the key component, sir, that makes this, this uh, very different than, than past efforts. Sir, can I hop yeah, in? Please add it. Any of you can add, jump in at any time. So, no so I mean, like, there's a couple of things. To the IPSA team, the technical, and I have a little bit of knowledge on this, but I would not call myself an expert. Greg and, and his crew are. But the technical difficulties of integrating all these databases is pretty tough, tough to get your heart, your, your head around. But it is an exceptionally technically difficult problem that these guys have, have jumped on and have really made great progress on. And why this is fundamental to all the things that we do with talent management is, 
If you don't have granular knowledge of everyone who's in your inventory, if you don't understand the knowledge, skill, behaviors, and preferences of every officer, you can't actually do talent management. So IPSA is foundational to all the things that we try to do within talent management. Because if you don't have that knowledge, then what you do is sort of talent management by exception. Okay, so you have an officer distribution system, and some people are individually managed, but, but not everyone is. And so this is what is gonna give us the ability to systemically across the entire officer corps at first to do talent management and then expand that to the rest of the force. And so these things are so nested. Now, that is great, and I was gonna, I'm glad you got your hand up there, so, General Evans, so I was yeah, gonna point to you. Just to kind of dovetail on that, I think what really is important about- Marcy, Can you pull the mic a little closer? Just I think what's really important about IPSA is, is having one database of record for the entire Army with all compos. Greg touched a little bit on, on the Army National Guard. I think when you have all compos in one database, you can manage talent across the Army to increase uh, readiness and lethality. And, and that's always been a problem for the personnel system. We've got about 300 disparate systems. And even now, you have the different compos on different personnel systems. But um, you know, I, I agree with um, General McGee. We cannot look at one system and account for 1.2 million soldiers right now, today. We have to collaborate with the reserve component and the active component to, to one count them, and certainly have phone calls and emails to, to manage talent. So if I could ask you, uh, Jason, to go one step further. So how do you see, is it, or is it too early to tell, some of the changes that IPSA is bringing that's gonna drive change at the desk who's answered the phone and talking to the soldier in the well, field? First, so that's great. So they can see everybody now, right? Yeah, that's and so a start. <laughs> for, H for HRC, we will become the proponent for military personnel pay. Um, pay will not, we will be the top of the system instead of DFAS. And so we're, we're, we're building that construct now. So IPSA will allow us to, to one, do that, manage pay from, from the unit level all the way to HRC. Um, it'll create greater transparency for the assignment officer to communicate across components, because one thing um, that DOTMA will give us uh, and ROTMA will give us uh, greater permeability. Um, and General McGee talked about a little, little bit of that, bringing per people in and out from private industry to active component. When you do that now, there's a, there's a huge bureaucracy and delay in pay sometimes. There's delay in pay if you're a reserve component here and you've, you've come to active component and back. There's some delay in how that, that pay goes. So we think IPSA will create that seamless process of, okay, you're now in the database and your pay is affected. So that, that is uh, one of the a couple things that we think IPSA will do for us. Super, thank you. So let's switch a different topic here. So over to uh, uh, General Evans and General Williams. Could John, yeah, um, so what, and I'm gonna combine these two questions together. So, what, so how's the Army doing in increasing diversity within the officer corps? And then how does ROTC specifically differ from the other commissioning sources in terms of providing diversity to the, to the broader Army? That's a great question. We spend a lot of time uh, working on the diversity uh, complex problem, if you will, making our army look more like our country, uh, which is a tough thing. General Williams kind of alluded to it a few minutes ago. We, we have become, to a certain degree, a, a, a family business, and, and that is particularly true in the officer corps. There's, there's goodness to that. You know, it's a legacy of service, and we pass things along to our sons and daughters, but there's also a caution there that we are becoming a little too narrow in our uh, scope. So one of the things that ROTC does, and, and West Point does it too, but they do it in a different way, they go out across the country, and I'll let the soup talk about, about how they do that and bring diversity in, but we've got programs, 274 different ROTC programs across 953 colleges and universities in the country. And so the young man or woman that goes through an ROTC program at Louisiana State University is coming from a different cultural setting than someone that goes through a, uh, an ROTC program at Washington State University. Because they're different parts of the country, they have different uh, norms, uh, different, uh, not necessarily values, but different ways of looking at problems. And so we're bringing that level of diversity in by virtue of the experience of the uh, cadet on campus. They bring that into the Army, and then they share that with their peer group. Uh, and with regards to kind of the richer thread of diversity, getting away from, you know, uh, more Caucasian-based and, and become a little bit more sensitive to African-American component, Hispanic component, Asian Pacific Islander component that we need to continue to enrich ourselves with, 
We are looking for ways to leverage uh, communities that are out there in the social space, because we're, we've not been in the social space the way we need to, and we're starting to get more active in that space, to bring more people to us so that we can invent, convince not just the potential cadets, but also those chief influencers of the cadets, the mothers, fathers, grandparents, aunts, uncles, the people that are helping them make the decisions to serve. We want them to be able to choose the Army. Thanks, John. Uh, quite simply, uh, diverse problems require a diverse population. And so uh, at the United States Military Academy, we have, uh, we we're enjoying this year, this last class that just came in, the largest ever, second largest in terms of uh, uh, women, I'm sorry, largest in terms of women, 24.5 percent, and second largest in African American that just came in. Uh, we try to aspire, I'll speak about the African American population, to be higher than the officer population that's in the Army that I'm looking at right now. So we are higher than the percentage in the Army right now. Uh, so my, I have a great admissions team. We go at this very, very methodically like John does. We spend a lot of time. John and I talk a lot because it's very important, and uh, I know General Bromberg knows this as well, and, and Mr. Williams, that there's no, there's no gap here. You know? So it's one big Army and this happens to be another accession to me. And so it's very important that we go after the talent, as Mr. Williams talked about, and that it's diverse. Uh, these problems that we're going to have in the 21st century require creative solutions. And we think at West Point that creative solutions come from diverse input. And so it's very important. Uh, about 25% of our population are Division I athletes. So you've got Division I athletes, a quarter of the population, You've got a quarter of the population that is women, 15.3% African American, and on so forth in terms of Hispanic and Asian population. So very important that uh, the, the audience I'm looking at right now, very diverse, that the leaders that graduate and lead soldiers in combat look like the soldiers they're leading. And so it's very, very important that we continue to uh, go after that, sir. Thank you. Okay, so the next one is, is, a, is a great question because I, th I think that people go back and look at experiences, and this one has to do with the AFPAC program. And so I don't know who the best person is to answer this. This might be General Evans. It could be, but, it, but it's a good question. I think it's, it's worthy to bring on this, this forum here. So, so it's the AFPAC uh, program, and I'll modify it a little bit, uh, has had a significant impact on Army captains and majors. Some would say not all positively. Okay, as you look back at it. So um, as you looked at what their success is coming out of that program, which was, the, and again, which there was a clear need for at the time for the nation and for the Army, what lessons have we learned as we go forward as we apply that to talent management? So I don't know if that's a General McGee or General Evans question, so but I'm going to throw it out to this august group up here and let them dive on that so one. I'll, I'll jump on that one. So, um, and I'll use the security force uh, assistant brigades as, as how we've evolved that. Um, We've given special instructions uh, to boards in the memorandum of instructions for APAC hands to try to get at the very thing you're talking about, sir, to make sure that we don't, we don't have officers in programs that don't necessarily lead to their success. And if you look at what we've done with SFABs, we've been able to, once they've been trained, is to give them additional <coughs> skill identifier. And what's unique about that the DMPM of the Army, the Director of Military Personnel uh, Management, who works for General Siemens, General Callaway, whenever they do board requirements, they can set floors and ceilings. And an example of that is the recent release of the Master Sergeant promotion list, which was a, a, approximately 25%. But for the SFAB, it was 50%. So uh, we've looked at that when you, when you were asking officers or enlisted, it's not just the officer problem, it's an enlisted problem too. We're asking them to go do special things for the Army for the right reason um, because we've decided to leverage SFABs on, uh, and not a, a BCT on a, on a, on a you need BCT for you know, large scale combat operations. Um, we've, we were mindful about the people we're putting in there because the people who are in SFAB, just like APAC hands, were screened. And they were screened to be quality people that were in there. So I think, um, just to keep it short, I think we've evolved. Um, I think whenever we, we need those special uh, teams to do that, uh, that's a way to do it, to make sure that we give them an additional skill identifier, and when selection boards come, you make sure that, that we have a floor or ceiling in there to manage uh, the success on the other end for them. Hey, can, can I jump on yeah, that? Please, yeah, please, please. No, this, this is a good topic because, you know, people I, look at the past yeah, to, to see the future. I don't have any particulars 
you know, special skills in AFPAC hands, but this is one of my pet rocks. Um, and, and Jason talked about board instructions and what we put in the MOIs when we go to boards. Um, we, we've got to reinforce what we put in board instructions for promotion boards with board behavior. And having sat multiple officer boards, and I know General Williams has as well, um, we don't do that. So what we do, ducks pick ducks. Mm -hmm. And it gets to Michelle's point about why can't I be Chief of Staff of the Army? Well, if the board instructions say we need a broad uh, base of talent spread across lots of different experiences in the Army so that we have the best leaders and the best jobs, then we've got to make sure that when we go to the board, we're picking people that look like that and not the people that look like us. So again, my pet rock, but I like talking about AFPAC hands as an example because I can remember when Chairman Mullen, I think it was, said, we're going to do this program, we're forcing it down from OSD, you're going to make this work services, get after it. And we said, yep, got it. And we put it in the MOIs, and then we let all these folks fall by the wayside. So anyway. So, sir, if I could, you know, so it is easy to bring up examples of where we probably didn't Thanks. meet the goals that we wanted to have. So the examples of the AFPAC hands comes up, the example of MTT commanders being equal to battalion commanders. And, but I think if you take a couple steps back, and this is what's great about this, you know, assignment, this job, and this mission, is you get a chance to really look at this. I think what it drives is us to create a system that understands that over time the needs for our personnel system are going to be flexible and agile and need to change. Because every chief is going to, every chief and secretary is going to want to do something different. And the system that we're imagining going forward needs to be supple enough to be able to handle those inputs and take those changes. And then frankly, there needs to be the data to help them see how that is happening across the entirety of an officer's career. So those people who went to AFPAC hands, how they're being treated to make sure we don't break that faith. And then it needs to be the forum so that Army senior leaders at the highest level are getting progress reports of how these things are happening so these things don't slip off the table. And then down the road, you've found a bunch of very high quality officers whose careers you've just ground off. Not because of any malign intent, but just because the forums don't exist to inform strategic leaders of, of how we're actually executing along those. And that's, that's informing our way forward as we're looking at something uh, that we want to develop. Super. Thank you. Great. Great discussion. Did you have a question or you? you Go, oh, come on up to the microphone. I can just. Uh, there you go. Uh, gentlemen, ma'am, thank you. I'm Carl Wheeler. I was an infantryman. Uh, now I'm a virtual reality startup founder and I'm an advisor to a cold prevention research lab in New Jersey. Uh, I have two questions. One is uh, this uh, question that I like to ask in conversation, and it's uh, Peter Thiel's contrarian question from his book, Zero to One. Uh, and this is to no particular general, uh, but what's something that you believe to be true that few people in your organization believe is true? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Yeah, uh, like, you know, that again? Something, yeah. What is something that you believe, uh, that you've come to believe is true, uh, but perhaps you might be the only one, or maybe there's a few other people believe that, but you think it's true, but other people around you or in your organization don't believe it's true. So in other that words, could, you've got a vision at the top, but maybe not everybody else is supporting that vision? Uh, you, or, or perhaps it's, a, it's an idea uh, or, or a belief that not many people hold or maybe something that isn't kosher to hold or uh, or I, just I'll take a shot at that it won't necessarily be with regards to my organization but I, but what I what I do spend a lot of time doing is talking about the quality of the young men and women we have and I, I think the soup would support me here uh, we, we I think we have a tendency uh, in our culture to paint the generation behind us with a very broad brush and so you hear a lot about Millennials and generation Zers and how they're disengaged and they're not you know, they, they don't want to be involved and they want to step back and they don't want to be their parents' generation uh, and they're not committed and they're not, uh, they're not, they don't have any sense of national loyalty or selflessness. And I, I find that to be untrue. Uh, we've got incredible men and women out there, young men and women in our colleges and universities uh, coming out of our high schools that want to do things that, that have a selfless purpose. They want to go out there and serve a cause greater than self. Uh, and I think we just have to shine a bright light on them and show them off because too often we're shining the light on, you know, uh, other folks that are in the limelight that, that maybe don't hold that value. So I'm, my, now my organization believes that the same way I do, so maybe that doesn't qualify as an answer to your question. But I think society at large kind of looks at the, the millennials and says, hey, these folks, they don't get it. 
I think they do. Thank you, sir. Uh, second question, uh, Colonel Johnson. Uh, I know you mentioned that, and I think this is a hot topic, the data consolidation for personnel records. Uh, and I know everyone has a great idea. Have, uh, has your organization thought about using any kind of blockchain solution to uh, bring together and consolidate data? Yeah, we're, as, as we think through those, those 200 systems, what's authoritative? So we've defined what's authoritative, but as you start to look at the authoritative data, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so the you know, easy answer to your, your question is yes, we've thought of many different ways to go at this. Um, you know, our, our first step, though, is we, we solidified and identified the authoritative data. So that was step one, you know, kind of identify your total problem set. Um, what we've done now is, okay, let's go and address the data that's incorrect, that's missing um, in that authoritative uh, data sources, which is quite a bit. There's quite a bit of work there to be done. And as, as we move to the right, we're starting to notice that, hey, maybe it's too difficult to actually update this type of data in what's defined as the authoritative data source. So that's where we push those, those questions up to the senior leaders. Do, do we want to change this, yes or no? Um, and then at the end of the day, it's, this, some of this is going to come back to individuals. Um, and and how, do we, how do we involve, you know, the one million soldiers um, in this process? How, how do we open this transparency to, to really get this, this duality of discussion? Hey, I can, I can see some of your talents, I can see some of your data, um, but how do I ask individuals in the Army to share with us their holistic talents? And this maybe goes back to your first question. Um, there is a ton of talent, a ton of talent, and General Evans talked about it, in our Army, um, but we don't know all of it. We don't know all of it. We don't know the holistic talents of everybody in the Army. And really what we're trying to do with IPSA is to get into this discussion via a system that, that the Army can utilize, that individuals can utilize um, to better that experience, to enhance readiness and tie it to lethality. So um, maybe a long circular answer there, but, um, but um, the answer, easy, easy answer to your second one is yes. And, you know, we're on that journey in the middle of this trying to, trying to work the day. Thank you, gentlemen, ma'am. Thanks for, thanks for your question. If, if Greg, I think it might be helpful just for you to take 10 seconds and say authoritative database or authoritative, that, that piece, because I, I maybe they would not understand with the total personnel system what, what that means, why you have to have an authoritative data source. Well, sir, I would say, so right now there, there's a mixture of, 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 you know, that definition, right? So if you have multiple authoritative data sources, which system do you use for that data? So then you're looking at one system, it says one thing. I had a PT score of 249, but then I go over to the training authoritative data source and it says I have a PT score of 289. Well, why does that matter? Well, you, you promote junior um, soldiers based on that PT score. Well, if the PT score is incorrect in the authoritative data source, we are now inadvertently hurting a soldier. Um, and and the, the problem, sir, is that some of our systems are very difficult to use. Right. So then we, we tend to go to the easiest source in some cases, inadvertently um, hurting some soldiers and officers um, in their careers. Super, thanks. Sir, I'll, I'll, I got one question. I'll get to you after. So, just, so, so this one is, uh, and, I, and I think if General Lechner, if you could help us with this one too from your experiences. Um, we mentioned talking about extending uh, 40 years of service, uh, and what does that tie anything to an MRD? And the reason I ask you is because you have some civilians in your organization. You see different ages and different experiences. So it's not just about – somebody else is going to answer this. Jason's going to help us with this one here. So, um, so many professionals still have a lot to offer. So how do we think the 40 years of service across the force would play out? And then what do you see from the civilian side as well? So either, one, either Jason or one of you can – just your so, thoughts on that. So I'll, I'll, from, I'll talk to you about a military standpoint, and then I, I have some thoughts on the civilian piece. But um, for the military piece, if uh, the Dotman reform that, that um, General McGee was speaking of is there are officers that are very talented that we have sent to get trained in cases to get master's degree and PhDs, and that time away has, has really disadvantaged them, and they're, they're now 
uh, at their grade, right? They, they haven't been promoted. I think that the, with the change in dot mode, allow us to keep a major to 40 years if we like, uh, as long as that, that, that officer is performing and they have the, the skill set and, and we have a requirement for them. As you all know, we're growing the Army. I think that this is, this is uh, really apropos that we've got the DOTMA and ROTMA reform because it's allowing us to keep talent. And as long as an officer is willing to serve for 40 years uh, and perform at the grade of major lieutenant colonel or colonel, um, I think that's great. So uh, for the civilians in terms of serving, um, I, you know, when you talked about in your organizations, I think what the civilians really want to see is, is the, the change um, that the Army has talked about in terms of civilian workforce transformation, in terms of career map programs, um, because, you know, my organization, we have focused on uh, the human capital strategy for civilians. And DP map, uh, as is talked about with General Letcher, is, is a good start of that, because there's smart objectives that link them to the mission. But more importantly, with the civilians is an individual development uh, plan, an IDP, because that commits them to a professional development plan, and you can send them to the same kind of professional development training that they have for civilians that you can do for military. And when you when you link the the DP map, the, the, the smart objectives, and they have an IDP, you know who's in, right? You know who wants to go to the next level, because I can I think Mr. Williams will attest to this. We have plenty of requirements worldwide for civilians who wanna who wanna extend their career and and contribute. Um, at, at the next level, they, they can serve worldwide. And that's what I try to impress upon the civilians, my organization. My commitment to you is to, to, to get you to be the best civilian, the best trained civilian, but I, I can't promise you that I can promote you here. But the Army has requirements worldwide, if you're all in, that you can be successful. And there's nothing wrong if you just want to remain a, G, a good GS-13 and you want to commit there. You can document that in their individual development plan. But um, the civilians are, are a great source of continuity and expertise. Um, we, two thirds of the workforce at HRC, uh, they're civilians. We, we couldn't do it without them. So um, I think we as, uh, as leaders owe the same back to them as we are focusing on talent management for, for the officers. We owe that same commitment to the civilians for as long as they're willing to serve. So, so sir, can I hop in on the 40 year? I mean, sure. Well, so, please go ahead. It's an interesting conversation, right? Because let's just let's just say up front that 30 years and 40 years are completely arbitrary. I mean, they are the definition of an industrial model, right? Like, what's magic about 30 years right. of service vice what's 40 years? 40 years gives you expanded capabilities. But I think what 40 years allows you to do is to take an officer who is, let's just say, someone who's demonstrated tremendous potential along the ops track, goes all the way up to battalion command. And then all of a sudden, she's not selected as one of the few who gets to be a brigade commander. And then you look at the unique sets of knowledge, skills, and behaviors that she has, and you say, look, you're never going to be a brigade commander in the ops track, but what we recognize is you've got some unbelievable strategic communication skills. So let's get you a master's degree, and then let's utilize your talents in public affairs or strategic messaging or recruiting for the next 10 year that we're going to, 10 to 15 years that we're going to employ you so you get a return on investment. Mm -hmm of an officer later. And that probably wouldn't be for everyone, but that could be for someone who has demonstrated high potential to continue to, to serve at the, at the highest levels, but maybe just isn't the person who's going to be at the top of their field in the, in the ops track, which we know becomes tremendously Very competitive narrow. as you go higher and higher up in the, in the ranks. Sure. And then, sir, I'm just going to add on to No, you. please add, and then we'll come back to you, Daryl. Oh, sorry. No, go so, ahead. No, so the MRD piece doesn't, you know, I don't have a lot to say on that piece as it applies to us, but the ter in terms of requirements and retirements it does, we almost see like a camel in our organization. We have really young people or a huge group of people getting ready to retire. So there's no continuity no, over time with that. And I'm not exactly sure what drives that, but it's a concern not just in my headquarters, but across the organic industrial base. And then secondly, the moving part is really important too. When I took command, I started walking around and talking to everyone and a lot of people had finance degrees and I thought it was really odd in ammunition headquarters, <laughs> you know, people had finance degrees. But DFAS used to be at Rock Island. Yeah, transfer when DFAS over. moved, everyone <laughs> came over. So from a talent management perspective, and they're all great, great, you know, employees, but is a finance specialty, you know, really tied in with an ammunition headquarters and so yes. moving to looking at talent management from that perspective as well yeah. great thank you that's yeah but you're right about that because it's 
you know, across industry, that's uh, I work in industry. There's the same kind of challenges of this curve and cliff of, of gaps and seams. It's, it's, but there's different things that I'll come at the end that you can do in the civilian industry that the military hasn't adapted. So, Daryl, you had to come. I was just going to add, uh, I don't know if we have any more allies or partners in the room, but uh, I spent a lot of time in those right environments. And I would argue, hey, sir, how are you? Um, I would argue you can correct me back on it. But I would, uh, I just left, my last command was in NATO. And um, I would say on par, we, it, as we go forward with these initiatives, it may be helpful to look to our allies. I would say um, many of my contemporaries were five to ten years older than the average <coughs> captain, major, lieutenant colonel, colonel in general, if you will. Uh, my deputy was uh, four years older than I was. And so it may be a chance to harvest and look at, other models. I don't know if you want to comment, sir, on that. But um, as we go forward, <laughs> it may be an opportunity to harvest um, some of the efficiencies they've gained from having folks that are a little, probably a little older than our services. I just yes. pulled you on the panel. So good afternoon, <laughs> Colonel Marchand, French Army. Uh, it's right that in the French Army, uh, the age is very important to be promoted. Uh, and for example, you cannot be promoted as a brigadier general before being 50 years old. So that's, that's, a, that's a rule that forces um, people to be promoted quite later yeah. than they could be sure. for the ranks uh, before. And for example, because of that rule, now a uh, lieutenant colonel cannot be promoted, a colonel cannot be promoted be before being 42 years old, and a lieutenant colonel 37, and a major 32. So we have some exceptions. But it's right that uh, it is uh, uh, something that uh, um, is not so good to uh, promote people as quickly as we would like to. The point is that uh, we are suffering of um, a kind of, um, we, we do not have enough money to promote uh, as many colonels as we would like because everything is controlled by uh, our financial uh, ministry, who is um, able to say how many people in each rank we can have per year. So of course, it has a conse uh, consequence on the uh, prom promotion every year, and because of that, uh, the number of people that we have for each rank. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Hey, some applause for our guest panelists. How about that, huh? <laughs> yeah, that was a great discussion. It could, could be related to the farmer's commercial that you see on TV. You know, you, you know a lot because you've seen a lot. You've been around a long time. But uh, so maybe there's some correlation. Sir, you had a question. Thank you for being so patient. Uh, thank you. Rod Pennywell, Huntsville, Alabama, former service member. But, uh, and I really appreciate this panel because obviously this, uh, this subject deserves a lot of discussion. Uh, what I'm really t wanting to hear from is uh, General McGee and maybe General uh, Evans, if you touched on it, specifically as it relates to some of our very, very hard problems to solve, such as cyber. Uh, you know, we hear nothing but, you know, America's behind in cyber, we're losing behind in cyber to various countries and things like that. And of course, one of the things that uh, we have in terms of our military growth structure in terms of personnel is that we do a lot of cross-training. And oftentimes that cross-training is, is good for, uh, for all kinds of reasons, but in, in terms of the negatives, uh, cross-training don't necessarily make you become a PhD unless you want to be a PhD journal officer. So when it comes to cyber, specifically cyber, the IT, the software, the hardware, all of these other different things, and the globalization uh, issues. How is it that this structure here that we're talking about today is going to help us, A, bring, grow people in, that's going to help us, if you will, get ahead of the problem that we seem to be behind in, and secondly, uh, the approach, how does that, if you will, change the way we you know, grow and evolve, basically officers especially? So let me. I think it's coming to you because you got the cyber team. <laughs> so, it, so it comes up all the time, and you know, I think General Fogarty just sat on a panel here and got asked about 16 questions on talent management, and so it really is a bit. And I think at the core of it is how does the United States Army maximizes the national strength that we have in both IT, tech, and cyber, and use that to our greatest levels of operational effectiveness. And, and I think all of the flexibilities that we're talking about right now in terms of this, you know, what we're imagining this system we're going to be are going are to be those things that will allow us 
to really be maximally effective within within cyber. So specifically, already within the cyber branch, they're branching out a subset of the cyber officers that they have to make them specialists to be capabilities and tool developers. And so if you think about how cyber operations are conducted, these would be the experts who spend an entire career working a very technical piece of support to cyber operations. And effectively, these are the individuals who create the tools and the ammunition by which you do a cyber operation. So as you enter into an enemy's network, you find certain devices. They craft the tools and the exploits that can allow you to go after whatever piece of equipment that you find there. What we're finding is that that's a narrow specialty set, almost like having a neurosurgeon. So that we're developing a career path so you can come in as a lieutenant, maybe, and we're trying to figure out exactly when is the right time to declare for that. But you can stay in that for 30 years right now as an officer, and you can only work that skill set so you can be the best in the world in terms of that capabilities and tool development so you can contribute to that. The other thing that's unique in cyber is that you, we, we, we've got to be able to expand the way we look at how we build readiness because I can make a very strong case that you could take a high-quality captain, move them to the civilian sector, let them work in a tech firm for four to six years, and when they come, came back, they would actually increase our operational readiness as opposed to decreasing it. Now, you couldn't do that for an infantry officer, right? Like if you threw an infantry officer and you had them go work at Google for six years, they probably wouldn't come back and be more effective. But for the, some of these technical officers, <laughs> You, you would really see a rise in that. And that one of the, one of the initiative groups that we have, one of the, uh, the, the elements that we're looking at is this idea of permeability. And what's permeability not just look from the active, the guard to reserve, but also the civilians to be able to ma allow them to move out through into the civilian world seamlessly and then be able to come back, which is really the key component, much more rapidly. Because I think there's a whole bunch of untapped resources out there of people who have served who have gone out but have found it tremendously burdensome to come back into uh, the Army and contribute. And so these are all the things that we're looking at. And then you can just by not having cyber officers or any officers on this very regimented conveyor belt system of timelines and promotion boards and all that stuff, they get a chance to develop you know, these unique skill sets and then opt in to be able to go in, in for advancement. So these are all the things. and, and the only piece is, is, I would say, is as I have gone from doing talent management at Army Cyber to doing now talent management for the Army, is we tend to focus on this being something that is just cyber related. And cyber related is, in fact, you know, the one that I think is bright and shiny and has everyone's attention. But I think there is an expansibility of this to all sorts of other skill sets that we do within the Army that could, that could, could you know, take great advantage of these as well, if you think about some of the functional areas and skill sets. And the final piece, and I'll stop talking. I would argue that the Army was able to adopt around, adapt around the challenges of cyber because we had an existing IT infrastructure with our Signal Corps. We had military intelligence who had done a lot of SIGINT and an already you know, relationship with the NSA who had done lots of hacking. And so cyber came at us rapidly and, I mean, incredibly rapidly. But I would argue that cyber has come, came at us more slowly than some of these other challenges that we're going to have to face as an Army, whether that's bio-warfare or artificial intelligence, all these different things that are going to start changing the, the characteristics of the future operating environment, I think they're going to come at us much more rapidly, all of which, which means that we need to have an agile uh, officer management system to be able to get ahead of these and respond as they start developing and becoming more impactful to how do we conduct ground combat operations. Super answer. Thank you. So let's shift gears a little bit. We talked earlier about, uh, and the Secretary talked about uh, those that are willing and able to serve, and we also talked about the percent of people that are unable to serve for being obese or lack of fitness or other characters. So from the ROTC and, the, and, the, uh, and from General Williams' view, what, what do you see the youth of America and what initiatives do you have going on to help uh, look at those problems to bring in more qualified people? So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put on my, my TRADOC hat for my boss a little bit and talk uh, about some of the things that we're doing right now with regards to the uh, new Army Combat Fitness Test, which I think has gotten quite a bit of, uh, of role <coughs> and, uh, and a lot of attention at the conference this, uh, this week. Um, Malcolm Frost, who owns the, uh, the Center for Initial Military Training, kind of is the proponency for how we do our officer training once they leave the commissioning source. Uh, and, and move off into the officer forces, new uh, lieutenants. And we've looked at this population, we've looked at our population of recruits as well, and we have decided, hey, we've only got about 30% uh, 
uh, of the military age men and women in our country that are that are fit to serve. Now, some of that's not physical. Some of it can be psychological. Some of it can be legal issues and other things. But there is a real problem we've got we're facing as a nation, and we've got to get our mind wrapped around how to get better at it. The Army Combat Fitness Test is the new testing metric that we're going to use to measure overall total component fitness. Now, it's a test, and there's a lot of focus on it because it's replacing our record test, the APFT. And so there's some angst, and there's some concern, and there's some anxiety, as you can imagine, anytime there's change. But more holistically, what it is, is it's just the output of what we want to do with regards to total fitness. So we want to focus not only on the physical component of exercise, but the other two stools of that, uh, other two legs of that stool, that uh, performance triad that has to do with rest, sleep, for years and years in our Army, we've all just kind of powered through it. Down, down the table, here's one of my buddies, he and I have passed out at the same table before downrange after working long, long hours thinking that we could just power through it, not realizing the data shows us that really after a week of sleeping only about three hours, you're operating like you've had two or three beers. You're impaired. And you're telling young men and women to assume risk while you're in this impaired state. So the Army's got to get over this. I can power through it. I don't need rest. You need rest. Your brain needs rest. Your body needs rest. And then there's the nutrition component, which is a real challenge for all of us uh, as a society. And that can't start when an 18-year-old walks into the Army. We've got to start earlier than that talking about uh, better overall nutrition and value. We're trying to do that in some of our junior ROTC programs out there, and we will get some of those young men and women into the Army force, uh, about 25%. But we've got to start looking at this thing uh, from a totality standpoint in society. So the ACFT is our way to generate change in how we're looking at overall fitness so that we work not just on endurance and, and muscle strength, but core, agility, flexibility, and then being able to protect ourselves and make sure that our soldiers can last longer on the battlefield. Yeah, just to double tap that a little bit, uh, we are as well. In fact, this week it's going on, I think, today up at West Point, uh, the ACFT. In fact, we have another population that we're looking at. We're trying to provide value back to uh, General Townsend, the chief, and the secretary on their fitness. Is We have a 40 over 40 population as well. I think my commandant just took his test today. So. Uh, uh, the idea is, as John mentioned, is to get way left of this. In our recruiting and our outreach, we talk about this. In fact, this Saturday, uh, in route to beating San Jose State on Saturday, oh, oh, uh, yep. uh, I will talk to a group of uh, young cadets, and we talk very seriously about these young men and women. And we say, look, uh, we know you're smart, uh, but you're going to be on your feet for a long time. We expect you to, to walk a long way in the summer when you come in. This is a military academy, so we talk very seriously about this generation that spends a lot of time uh, doing this. Uh, you're going to spend a lot of time standing and just moving, and so this, you know you're going to you're going to take your 12 mile uh, uh, walk back from uh, our, your summer camp. You're going to take the new ACFT, but you're going to have to be physically active and vital for 20 hours a day. Uh, you know, 18, 20 hours a day for a long time, and so we talk about that way left in our outreach and our admissions process. And I'll start talking to these high school kids um, uh, every weekend when I, I use it as an outreach. And uh, we're using those also, just one last uh, thing here. All of our away games, uh, General Townsend has been tasked by the Army to look from a campaign perspective, John and I, to outreach and get at uh, recruiting and make sure we're getting the right athletes in. And so I'm taking every opportunity, all of our away games, to do that and set up a shingle here and say, hey, we're one part of the Army. Here's the other parts of the Army, OCS as well. And here are the requirements. Here is the physicality. you got to be smart, but you also got to be fit, and you got to be ready to go. So uh, thanks for the question. Super, thanks. Let's, let's bounce back to Ipse. Cause, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Go, lights are right here. Go right ahead, ma'am, please. Thank you. Hi. I'm Jenny Davis, a retired Army officer. Um, that discussion made me actually think about what the uh, Army is doing to identify and to develop intellectual dexterity, but that's not really the question I stood up to ask. I was more curious, General Letcher, of your perspective on, of the discussion today, which of these initiatives you think actually will lead to development of the next generation of Eisenhower, the what leads your, you to be able to be recognized as the, you know, to the Army as a potential next chief of staff, 
And similarly, your NCO counterpart's potential to be the next sergeant major of the Army. So of these initiatives that, that everyone is talking about, which actually leads to that potential for a large portion of our military? Thank you for the question. So I think all of the initiatives contribute, but I think the one thing we really haven't spoken a lot about is the individual responsibility to any of these programs. And so as we build mentorship tools, as we look at skills, attributes, behaviors, individuals have responsibility to make sure that they're doing the walk, right, that they're not sitting on the couch. They have the responsibility to ensure that they adapt to a new physical readiness test. They have a responsibility to take advantage of opportunities that are out there. And so I think all of these contribute and add flexibility to maybe do a system that was a little more rigid, but I really think it's gonna come back on the individual in the end. So can I just throw one thought in there uh, as well? So it's interesting in the conversation about talent management, the examples of Eisenhower and Marshall and others come up. And I just think it's important for us to recognize that that is a subset of the larger field of talent management. And so part of it is to find those people and uniquely manage them as they go up. But it's also, you know, it's really important that the message gets out that talent management is not about just the top 5% of any cohort. It's actually how everybody contributes in the maximal way to contribute to the, uh, to the Army. And that's so often people come up and say, well, you know, talent management, you're dealing with the top 1%. It's not. It, it's, it's much, much more than that because it's the belief, it's the knowledge that everybody has something to contribute and get them in that position where they can actually contribute is going to make the Army better, not just getting the future Eisenhower in as the chief of staff or as the SAC year. Great point. Sir, over to you. Good afternoon, Paul Fort. I'm CEO of uh, LTC Partners. We are a federal government contracting firm that specializes in administration for uh, uh, federal and military programs, benefits administration. My question is, is this. Um, it's cultural, and I don't know that we've really talked about that too much, although we touched upon it when we were speaking about diversity. But in his uh, 2015 book, um, called The Return of Marco Polo's World. Robert Kaplan talks about the inevitable shift in power from the Atlantic corridor over into Central Asia, based largely or driven largely by demographic and economic forces. My question is, what, what does the 2028 plan that we're reading about and that you've been talking about more broadly, do to prepare uh, our future military to deal with languages, mores, uh, belief systems, uh, non-European, non-Western cultural systems in which there may be, uh, that may very well prove to be future scenes of conflict. Thank you. So, Sorry, I can. you want to, well, I, I know there's some things that we do with the academy. Maybe we can start with the academy, because I think that's a great place to start from partnership programs, language, and then sure. go on down if there's anything from the yes, command, sir. and then, then JP. So we bring in, uh, to get to your point, and uh, it's actually one of my efforts. I'm sort of completing my 100 days as the new soup, so I'm looking at areas. Um, and I actually think I've looked at the language program, and uh, if you're on a sort of math science track, you're required to take a, two semesters of a language. Uh, if you're on the humanities, it's a, it's a year and a half, essentially three semesters. Um, I'm looking at it, it's feel, still very novel for me in terms of what I'm going to do about it, but I think it's very, very important uh, that we, the more you understand another culture, everything you just talked about, the mores, the language is very, very significant. So, Currently our program is, we have enrichment programs. They're called AIADs, Academic Individual De uh, Development Programs. So they go out and they interface and they spend time in other countries. ROTC as well, I won't take John's thunder, I'll let him talk about that. But it's very important that our soldiers, uh, I actually, when I talked to all the new class, I had all the international cadets stand up. And I said, uh, I talked to the, uh, the Americans in the room, I said, look, uh, these cadets that are here, 
are going to be the future chiefs, chairmen of their countries. That's why they're here. They wouldn't be sending folks who weren't qualified. So get to know them. It's an opportunity to work downstream with the rela cultivate the relationships that you're going to need in the future. Now, we get that mandate from the State Department and the Department of Defense of those countries of those cadets that were here at, that are at West Point. Just last week, uh, two weeks ago, we had the Prime Minister of Kosovo there, we had the President of Liberia, and the President of Georgia visiting because it was UN General <coughs> Assembly Week, and their cadets were there. And we, and we met with them, and they were very impressed with the interaction of the, the U.S. cadets with the international, with their cadets. So it's fundamentally a part of our program, not only from an interaction piece, but from a language and a study. And they can study the different uh, aspects of uh, the his from a historical standpoint, or it can be a major that they can take as well. So very, very significant and important to an outcome that we're looking for at the Academy. John? Yeah, we, we do some of the same things the Academy does with regards to kind of, uh, it's, it's a little more episodic for us, frankly, because of the size of our population. We have a program called the uh, Cultural Understanding and uh, Leadership Program in the summer. We, we combine it with our cadet summer training. We give cadets an opportunity to the tune of about uh, 1,000 to 1,200 cadets get to do this in the summertime to go out across the, uh, the geographic combatant commands and work with the Army component commander in those areas. They get coupled up with uh, partners and they go out and they visit either the military training institutions there or they go out to one of the field units and spend three to four weeks with them. And, and, it, and it's a cultural touch. You know, it's certainly not an immersion. It's certainly not enough. But it, what it does do for young men and women, and when I talk to them, I, I got to talk to a large group of them before they left this year. I ask how many have never been outside of the, the United States. It's about a 50 percentile. I mean, you'll see half the room's hands go up. That is a hugely informative process for them. Um, I think languages are more problematic, uh, and I say that because I took uh, Spanish and French in high school and college, and I speak English. So, uh, I say it also because I come from the soft community where the special forces branch in particular is immersed in trying to make sure that people build language skills and it is incredibly tough for them to do that despite significant resourcing and a significant focus on it. So people who come to language late in life if they're not English second language or they didn't grow up in a, in a cultural setting where they had another language that was spoken in their home, very hard for them to pick it up once they get to college particularly when they're trying to focus on some of the other things that are a little bit more basic blocking and tackling where we need them to focus. So I think that's one we've got to continue to work at, but, but that, is a, that is a hard nut to crack. So I would argue that General Evans and General Williams were looking at how we're bringing people into the officer corps and how we're developing officers you know, as, through, that, through that sort of crucible process of making them, but I'll, I'll approach it from a, of a different angle. So you know, imagine war in 2030 where we can't predict what that is going to, to mean. But what you would need to have is a personnel system that is managed, you know, a talent management system that is actually developed within the Army Officer Corps, a broad set of skills that we have knowledge of and then can task organize and tailor to the crisis and the mission and the, 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 uh, the operation that is going to come up. So that's a piece of it. That's conceptual how I think, you know, we need to be able to move forward. And then the other piece of this is that any prediction of what warfare is going to look like in 2030 will invariably be wrong, but we could probably make some pretty accurate positions of what future warfare is going to look like by studying some of the trend lines that we have. And just just as, as suggestions, and not saying this is what we're, we're, we're defaulting to, but, but you, know, you could probably argue that in 10 to 15 years, combat is combat in the operational environment is going to be data rich instead of data poor. So how do you mine through this wealth of data that is out there? You're going to have to rely upon a team of experts that are very knowledgeable in these niche te technologies that are becoming more and more impactful for how we conduct operations. You're going to need to have a diverse team of allies and also within the United States government to, to be able to tackle any of these problems because of the interconnected nature of this. You're going to need to be able to be a good strategic communicator and you're going to have to be able to operate greatly decentralized, almost mission command squared from what we're doing right now as operations become, you know, as, as more and more of the earth is continually mapped by overhead, you know, satellites on an almost hourly basis in, in probably a decade or so. 
So I think you could start using what these trends are going to be, what those frameworks are, are what we're going to need in terms of strategic leaders, and then start developing the assessment tools and then the development tools to see that you've got an officer corps that has developed along those skill sets, and then you've got a measure of assessing them before you put leaders into strategic positions as they go along the strategic path. But I think that's the way those all come to toge together to create an officer corps that in 2030 is ready to dominate in a in a very uncertain operational uh, you know environment. Can I just add, sir, you know one thing. Go, you want yeah. to go first? Sir? Yeah. So I just like to comment on that. You know, um, the personnel community for some time now and currently, you know, we we do send officers uh, for intermediate uh, level education, CGSC equivalent to our international partner school, and we do it at the strategic le uh, leader level for senior service college. And it's a great point you make. And so when we do this talent management assessment, do we need to calibrate that a little bit in terms of where we have people? Um, and, and I know Greg will jump on this, but I, I think I talked earlier about IPSE, one personnel database of record. We are not as rigorous as we used to be in defense language assessment battery. We don't do that on initial like we used to do to see who has a propensity or a skill for language. I think IPSE will give that to us because inside of IPSE, um, and even inside of AIM right now that we have, officers can self-identify because they're allowed to fill out a resume. And there are, and General Williams talked about it earlier, about the diversity of, of, our, of our Army. And there are many people that speak multiple languages. We just can't take advantage of that right now because we can't see it all. But I think the AIM is a great start um, because we can allow officers to fill out resume and many self-identify in terms of speaking multiple languages fluently. Super. Sure. Th thank you. Go ahead, Jay. Go ahead. I would just add that so experiences matter, right? I mean, I, I, I don't, from my perspective, experiences really matter, um, but we don't necessarily capture experiences very well right now. Um, but but, but IPSA is going to allow us to do that, and, and it can shape to what types of experiences really matter for us. And, and I think that's that's where this is a growth and, and, a, and a flexible tool that will allow us to, to do that. So if you're having experiences before you come in the military at, at USAMA and ROTC, uh, and other places uh, that matter, that we define uh, that matter, we'll be able to track those in the future, uh, let alone what you're doing uh, currently uh, in, in operational uh, assignments today. Um, so for instance, we don't necessarily track who goes to an NTC rotation or when they went to an NTC rotation, but you can in the future by simply updating duty status in IPSA. I know that you were an S3 in a battalion and you went for two weeks you know, because your duty status said so. That we can we can use that data uh, holistically with other self-professed experiences to start building a complete holistic talent profile of individuals. Um, and how we define what matters more um, that that's that's probably coming. Um, but the system will be flexible to to take that kind of information um, that we can utilize in the future. Super. Thanks. So we have about. Uh about 15 minutes left, and it's great because I actually have about 15 questions that we're not going to get to, unfortunately. So I apologize if we don't get to your question, but that's really good. So I really appreciate the people that walked up to the microphones and also the additional questions. So let me uh, just advise the panel now that in the last five minutes, I'm going to ask you one question and get your opinion on it. And that, that question is basically going to be, um, if you look, and you can think about this, and I'm going to come back to an audience question, but if you think about this at the end, what I'd like, like, like you to talk about, if you could, is what would be the one significant change during your watch that you would like to see the Army make with regards to this subject? And we'll come back to that, and I'll give you all about a minute to give a response to that as we get ready to close out. So I'll go back to the audience question. And, and so with talent management being conducted at HRC for assignments, is there any plan to incorporate help from the proponent to assist with particularly enlisted career management, question one. Second part, which ties to that pretty closely, is if the, what happens within the strength management process when it gets at odds with talent management, the old vacant billet versus the good fit discussion? So it's a great, great, great question. So the answer to that is, um, you know, yes. Um, um. <laughs> Okay, now, I'm not going to let you fly on that, okay? Now, come on now. I, I got this. Now, that is not a good idea. Come on. Yes, come, no, no. So come on. 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 Come on.
And there is uh, some tension in that when you're talking about growing an army and you've heard uh, what the, from senior leaders what we're trying to get to in terms of you know, 500,000 or, or whatever that is, right? So at the end of the day, you, you try to balance that with um, an officer's preference. And, and I can tell you, um, most of the times, uh, assignment officers are faced with, you know, uh, more, more requirements than they have the, the kind of person that they need to put somewhere. There is there's always that tension. So you try to balance the two. But at the end of the day, it's the active component manning guidance. And what I talked to you about AIM, in terms of preference and transparency and putting all the requirements there, I think that's really important because sometimes if the, the officer can't see what you're trying to manage, then they think that, you know, you're just slamming me into a requirement. So I'm all about transparency. Put all the requirements in the market and, and you get the units involved with how, what they need to define in terms of the talent they need for that requirement and they can interact with the individuals and say and really define what they need. But at the end of the day, it is about meeting the Army requirements. And those Army requirements, the, the guiding uh, you know, principle is the active component manning guidance. Because at the end of the day, that is what is gonna increase readiness and that's what's gonna increase uh, lethality. Um, what was the second part of the question? So, is there any, you receive any help for, during this process Absolutely. from the from the proponents? Uh, for the enlisted, it's particularly enlisted, twenty-five um, for the officers, it's six hundred three. That's really by branch and by MOS. That tells you your career timeline. We get plenty of input from on the officer side with proponents, and they have board of directors for for the branches for the enlisted. We get the same kind of feedback. The Sergeant Major of the Army holds a senior Army Council. We get feedback then. Um, we. Command Sergeant Major Jefferson, I don't know if he's here, but he interacts with, with them um, and we get feedback. So, you know, yes, and you know, it, so what you have to understand about uh, HRC, we, we operationalize personal doctrine or personal policy. We don't necessarily create it, right? So if the proponents feel like 600-25, uh, something needs to change about that because something in the, in the field is operationally different, then we can deviate from that because that's policy. We just got a new national defense strategy. That's going to be the guiding light. It goes to the gentleman's questions about what do you need in terms of culture and language? Well, I think that's pretty telling if you read the national defense strategy, right? And so um, we are, we, we are um, more flexible than you think, but I would invite anyone here on any given day to come down and observe the requirements process versus the distributable inventory talent process. <laughs> Super, thanks. Okay, so I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, just a, a, a quick summary here, then I'm going to go back to you. I'm going to start with Greg at your end, your one significant thing you want to see in your watch to close it out. And so, um, so as we, we've heard a great panel here today, and, and you look at from the different levels. And if you look at, if you started with the secretariat level, the policies, the legislation, the interest from the Hill, the secretaries, defense, national security guys, all those things coming down into building the force for the officer corps that starts, as you know, the class center today is the future class is the colonels 30 years from now. I mean, think about that, how hard that task is. And going down into high schools with ROTC level, and influencing America with over 17, 1800 programs throughout the globe. That's a pretty daunting task, but it's influencing America for the future. And then you look at how Jason has to execute the day-to-day -day guidance, not just the Manning, but what I call the current fight. How do you get ready for things in the next 12 to 18 months? And then for General Lechner's point about a joint command where they have, and, and her, and have military and civilian that came up, but also her comments about what she's seen personally about her vision for the future when it applies back to her particular experiences. And then you look down into the future with the J, JP's talking about uh, how we look at talent management or what does it mean to the future, and then combining it all together with what Greg's doing on data. And what does that data mean? It's a great question here. I'm sorry we didn't get to it. But so you got all this data. Now what are you going to do with it? You know, that's a, big organizations tend to gather a lot of data and it sits on shelves, but he's doing all that work with those 25 blocks. So just look at that thread that goes across this organization. And this is a great panel, we've been very blessed by it. So to help us close it out, starting down with Greg, so what's the one thing you want to see, significant thing you'd like to see done on your watch? Whether you have control of it or not isn't the question, it's what do you want to see accomplished? Yeah, so, so this one's easy, we're going to put it say, so to the audience, to the yeah, audience. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So it's been a long time coming. We're, we're about ready for release two to be on the street, and then release three is coming shortly after. We're going to put it in a play in 20. So we're going to do that on my watch, sir. Uh, super. Thanks. 
All right. Good. So, so sort of the one thing I would I would highlight, and, and I'm going to say this, and it's a little bit of a statement, of the obvious, but it, it's 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 a fairly big concept, and that is, you know, we talk about assessments, and you know, say, look, so you know, it's an APFD, but but all of these assessments drive behaviors, and so to me, I think where we have you know a great opportunity to really drive some positive change is the use of assessments to drive positive behaviors amongst Super. our officer corps, and and to me. That's the piece. If we set up these assessment models to measure and to and to encourage these positive behaviors, the the, the great effect that could have on our army is, I think, uh, really interesting to me. Good comment. Okay, General Lecter. For me, so when I worked at HRC, there weren't a lot of exceptions to the rules. It was the rule, and I think what I heard you say today, General McGee, is that we're looking at there are exceptions to the rules, and if it takes care of the talent we will exercise them. So for me, I think what I'd like to see um, is that personal setbacks, whether it be illness, divorce, something going on personal in somebody's life that might set them back, it doesn't have to professionally end your career in the Army. And so that's what I'd like to see happen. Super. Jason. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're giving all the tasks for the HRC. I, I, you I, notice I, that, right? I PPs every day. <laughs> um, so I, this is my fourth time at HRC, and so uh, I, I, don't, I will tell you, we are not where we were at uh, 20, 10 years ago. We're not. Um, but the thing, the biggest thing is really the excitement of what we're going to do with DOTMA and ROTMA. And, and over 38 years, we've been constrained by really law of what we can do with the officer corps and talent management. This will allow us to extend careers, kind of promote who we, who we need to promote based on them having a particular skill set and, and assigning them and, you know, extending careers of, of people. Uh, you know, the excitement is, is the Army is growing. And we cannot, we cannot grow the Army, in my mind, in, in, without these authorities because we do need to keep officers around for longer than we're allowing them to stay at grade because there are people who will, who will stay to 40 years and contribute at major, lieutenant colonel, colonel. And so that, that's the, the, the excitement for me is, is the growing the Army and the new authorities we have here based on this legislative change of uh, uh, Dotman Rock. Super, thanks. Uh, staying in my lane for officer sessions, I would say the number one thing I'd like to see us do is continue to invest in a Department of the Army branching model that best optimizes cadet preference with uh, Army requirements. And I say that, and I think the soup will back me up here, because the number one thing any senior wants to know is, hey, what am I going to branch? And so most of them are going to get the branch of their preference. Some of them will not. And what I try to tell them when they become a little disenfranchised about not getting what they wanted is, we aligned you where the Army needs your talent, and you need to remember that all soldiers deserve to be well-led. Super. Yeah, to sure. pull on that thread, uh, John's got it exactly right, staying in my lane. You know, the 972 cadets that became lieutenants last year out of West Point, the hope would be that they were, that this program, that all the efforts that folks talked about would optimize the right athletes so that when they're standing in front of their platoon of young men and women about to LD, it's the right athlete at the right time who's going to take care of our sons and daughters. So it's about optimization of all of this is really what I would hope that we could get to in the, in the future years. Sir, closing. Well, I hate being the last one. Um, I'll say some of the annoying but, <laughs> I, I would say, um, you know, once we get this uh, human capital big data piece correct, it will tie all of this right here together. And we'll have the ability to know when, where, and how to put the right person in the right job at the right time. That's where I want to get you. Super. So how about a round of applause for our panel here? <laughs> so, so this is a superb panel, and I know I'm sorry, again, we didn't get to all the questions, but I know the panel will be up here for a few moments or on the floor if you want to grab one of them individually. So thanks again for your attention, and uh, have a great day. This has been a super panel, and good luck to all of you, and thank you for your participation. Oh, okay.